King. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I can say after uh, five or six weeks that I am I'm recognizing some people here, which is a good thing, I think. Um, so really, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I want to thank those people who come, of course, here in person, as well as those people uh, that are on uh, online uh, for this important state of the Union, State of the School Address. So um, I'm honored this year to introduce uh, Vikas Sukadmi. Um, when I look back and ask, I knew Vikas before he came uh, to this fine institution and uh, thought about my interactions with him there, which included energy, excitement, innovation, futuristic looking, sometimes a little Pollyannish, and thought, what can he do next? And this is what he did next. He came here and he did the same thing. And he made what otherwise would have been a dream a reality. The School of Medicine has had a long, illustrious history. I just had a chance to spend a few minutes with Tom and have met him before. And then, of course, I've spoken to Chris many times. And now, because having worked with him for the past several months, what Vikas has done is he's taken that legacy of strength and gone from strength to strength to strength. And over five years, I think all of you will agree that we're in an, we're in an incredible position as we look forward. When he came to this institution, he articulated a vision of uh, boldness, risk-taking, uh, aspiration. It's often said that uh, life is lived forward but only understood backwards. And what he's going to talk about today is what he's done over the past year. I don't think he's finished, but he's going to talk about that. He's built an incredible faculty. He has supported faculty here as well as brought in faculty. He's created an infrastructure really second to none. He's built teams because he understands the importance of team science. And whether it was through accidental collision or purposeful collision, as he used to remind me in Boston, he created an environment of innovation and impact. He recruited faculty here from really all over the country and jazzed them up, gave them excitement. And at the same time, in a very delicate and sensitive manner, made sure the people here received the support and the respect they, they deserved. He oversaw the development of the School of Medicine's first strategic plan for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And he transformed the educational curriculum as well. So before I close and invite him up to the stage, I just want to recognize a few other people that were involved in Vikas's uh, arrival here. And that person who deserves the credit is Dr. John Lewin. John, thank you for bringing Vikas to this fine institution. So the entire community here is so thankful for what Vikas has brought. It's also often said, another cliche, and I apologize, as Newton said, we stand on the shoulders of giants so that we can see further. So Vikas, come to the podium as you give your last State of the Union affair uh, address and show us how we have been able to establish this incredible foundation and now allow us to see further. So, I have a confession to make. I am an addict, a YouTube addict. See, every day that I get up, I have to learn something new. So I take five minutes and I use YouTube whether it's the right thing to do or not, you can, we can debate, and try to learn about a topic I know nothing about. That's been a lot of fun. So I decided in preparing for this talk, I would ask you to, how do you start a talk? And I went on to a video and it said, don't say thank you, which is why, Ravi, I didn't say thank you yet. Don't start by saying good afternoon. Instead, here are 10 ways to start, and one of those ways is 
I have a confession to make. All right. So now I can say thanks. So this has been quite a journey. These five years, I think, nobody would have predicted. And the trust that all of you have placed in me is deeply, deeply appreciated. The courage, resilience that you've shown has my deepest admiration. And I will not forget that. Let me also say that in the preparation of this talk, I've had great help from Camille Matthews, who's been here just a little while, and Rachel Sadlack Pretty and Ben King. Much appreciated. So if there's one thing I'd like to leave you with, it's that uh, we've created a new airlines. Greg Fenner doesn't know about this yet. And we are flying high. There's no question. We have taken off. There will be some turbulent times. We'll come to that at the end. So we will need to fasten our seat belts. But uh, we're fine. And I'll give you some data to support this. So first of all, on the research side. Here are the names of a few folks, new leaders in research. There are lots of folks that retired in the research umbrella. These are some of the leaders who have administrative uh, 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 places and are heavily involved in research. I won't cite all of the names. Many are in this room, in fact. Many, I'm sure, are quite familiar with you. And it's been an absolute pleasure working uh, with these folks. So we did, early on in the game, the first year or two, look at what might be potential metrics by which to judge our research success by. And as usual, we had a lot of debate. There were about 100, 200 faculty involved. And we talked about NIH ranking as one such metric. Needless to say, it's not the only metric and shouldn't be the only metric. But it is objective. You can compare with other folks. And there is some place to sort of direct your attention to. So we've done pretty well. And I'm proud to say that just this last week, Blue Ridge finally announced that we are now at number 13. 13 is the highest rank. <laughs> it's the highest rank we've been. And it shouldn't, that's, that's just the start. I think we'll do a lot better in the days ahead. I'll try to show you some data suggesting that we, we uh, are on, on, on the move on this as well. Some of it is COVID dollars, but I'm quite sure that COVID is not the only story in this. Uh, there are lots of folks at a very senior level who've been hired, and some at a very junior level that have been hired. And I'll just say parenthetically, one of the most pleasurable parts of this job was to talk with not only the senior folks, but actually the junior faculty that we were trying to recruit. They were my ears, still are my ears to the ground. I know what's going on, because they come here and they say, hey, you know what? Here's how it was at Hopkins, and how come you guys aren't doing this? Or here's how to do it better. Or are you guys really doing this well? So that's been very gratifying indeed. So uh, we give out, uh, we, we recognize those who have received large awards uh, from, uh, in terms of their grant support. Here are some of the names of folks who have received awards that exceed $3 million. And there are quite a few of them, as you can see. So after these meetings for about a year, a year and a half, we decided there was a five, we would come to a five point strategic framework. And many of you have seen this in some of the talks in the past. I've learned in this job, you cannot over communicate. You have to keep saying the same thing over and over again a certain number of times, and then it kind of gets into the culture, it gets into the spirit of things. So I think many of you have seen this, and I'll take you through this very briefly, give you an update. So the first piece is referred to as eminence. And we coined that phrase. I still remember there was a meeting in uh, Claire Sturck's house. Actually, it was kind of a semi-secret meeting of some kind. I, I have no idea. But anyway, she invited about 10 people who had just arrived and said, come to my house. And I'm trying to figure out how we sh what name we should give to this campaign. And I says, how about the word evidence? And now she's talking about the university campaign. Since I suggested it, I figured I could still hold on to it, which I have. And so this is how this title came about, Excellence to Eminence. Uh, so what are areas that we want to be eminent in, where we will be nationally renowned? And we had a long discussion about this. And we said these areas have to fulfill certain criteria. They should be based partly on where we already are fairly strong. It would be hard to go from zero to an eminent state in the span of five to seven years, which is what this plan is all about. We picked areas which have great potential for impact on human health. We picked areas where there was chance for philanthropic support. 
and so on and so forth. Areas also which if we did not invest in, we would be holding back not just that area, but other areas as well. So artificial intelligence slash informatics would be an example of that, for example. So what's happened then over these, um, uh, in, in, in what we decided is that it would need about 145 faculty to get us to position 15. We actually have done much better than that, as you've just seen. And that's only recruiting, so to speak, only 90 to 100 faculty. We're not yet done with the 145 that we wanted to recruit. That's still, we're still two thirds of the way through in this, and by no means finished. And there you see the NIH funded investigators, how the numbers have gone up. I won't spend time on the six areas uh, specifically. I think you know, it's fairly self-explanatory. Some there were particular reasons for that, that we can get into to, if you want to have a discussion about them. But uh, those were the sort of basic criteria that we used. So here's what's happened. Uh, and uh, I've told you already about our ranking. 17 departments, the highest, again, number that we've had in the top 25 in the nation. And uh, total grant dollars, 473 million from the NIH. And you see on the left how our 27 departments, we have 27 departments, including the basic science departments, clinical basic science, 27, how they have done, how they have fared. Uh, we just had a morning meeting with the, at, at the uh, Pediatric uh, uh, Institute, Emory and Children's Pediatric Institute. And we're excited about the fact that pediatrics is once again at number one in the Department of Pediatrics ranking. So congratulations, Saki, to you and your team. And so Lucky has set the bar pretty high. So high end decided to catch up this year. And um, is, is, we're in second position there, largely due to one grant, however, in all fairness. Uh, but uh, there is climbing up the ladder as well. So you can, see the, you can see the various things here. And by the way, a lot of the more senior folks their grant support is not included in this. That is, I'm sorry, the senior folks that we've recruited, the grant support is not included in this because that was attributed to the year that they got the grant, and that was before they moved to Embry. Also, as I said, we have a cadre of younger folks that I have a great deal of confidence in. So, uh, of course, I can make any predictions I want since I <laughs> won't be held accountable, but I honestly believe that we will be on a, on a continuing upward trajectory as we go ahead. So still work to do, uh, but uh, certainly quite gratifying. Now, second part of this framework was important because I didn't want folks to feel, those folks who are already here, to feel that they were being neglected. So there were a number of networking sessions that were organized. Kathy Greenling was involved in these blue sky sessions that she did for the Department of Medicine that sort of extended that. And the goal in these sessions was to get, it was speed networking. It was basically to get folks together. We would give them three minutes to talk, very proscriptive. They only were allowed three or four slides. And the last slide had to say what they could contribute to the community and what they wanted from the community. They were not allowed to mention dollars, and they were not allowed to mention space. And so we've held a number of these. And from these, a number of grant initiatives have come out and so on. And this was part of this second part of the framework. And that is, how do we help the folks already here? So we sort of invented this name, Imagine, Innovate, and Impact, sort of a virtuous cycle of things. And the idea was to put out about $2 million per year to start with and to see what kind of return on investment one would get. And the goal was to create new relationships, collaborations, uh, ideas that would have commercial potential, the IQ Venture Awards. And then if there was somebody here who didn't want to collaborate, really wanted to work on their absolutes by themselves and said, we're the greatest genius on Earth, that's OK. That's the I3 WOW Award on the upper left. And we had several winners of those uh, as well. And what was very uh, exciting about this is that about six to seven million dollars have now been committed, not all spent yet. And the return on this investment in terms of external grant support, sorry, I'm jumping ahead one slide, was 10 to one. $60 million have come in from the six million that we've put out. And I used to be involved running a similar program at Harvard as part of the Harvard CTSA. And that also was about a nine to one. And this is about 10 to one in a span of three years. So I hope it'll continue, hint, hint to Carlos. Um, all right, so uh, lots of applications. Every single department has been involved. All 27 departments have received awards through this. Greater than 100 peer reviews, lots of collaborators and collaborations that have been set up as well. And much more that can be done. So this was the, 
impact in terms of external grants, 58 million to be specific, and so on, and lots uh, of publications in some high impact journals. Now we didn't only, we don't only look at money in case that uh, uh, seems to be coming across here. There were a lot of fun things that were funded as well. Not that things that bring in money are not fun, but there were some really, we were not looking here for, uh, uh, for dollars and cents. So this was kind of a curious and museum-based education initiative at the Emory School of Medicine. We have a fantastic museum here, the Carlos Museum, of course. Uh, there are programs of this type uh, that interface between medicine and the arts in different ways, between music and uh, in uh, uh, museums and, and, and so on and so forth. Here is another program uh, which has global impact. And there are many things going on at the global level. And actually, we tend to underplay some of that. We were just honored by the delegation from Georgia, who was so respectful of what was started here many years ago. Um, so this is another initiative that uh, Steve Frozier uh, was involved in and uh, was really relevant uh, because of the COVID uh, uh, time. Part three has been what I refer to as partnerships in the, in the research framework. And you have to be somewhat selective. You can't do everything. And so we elected really to try to focus on three partnerships. The first was the Children's Hospital. The second was uh, with Grady. And the third in, with Georgia Tech, not necessarily in any particular order. And I have to say, the reason I particularly got excited about Children's was because John Lewin at that time with Donna Hyland was having a rather interesting series of discussions just as I was coming on board to really bring these two entities together around child health. And so I could just, one could imagine, just with a clearing up of what it was, what, 1,600 agreements, John, if I'm not mistaken, something like that, that were more or less scrapped and replaced by one agreement, which took a while to negotiate. And I was the beneficiary of that. I sort of came in towards the tail end of that. And it became very clear as we discussed all kinds of issues, from IP to philanthropy to running trials together and so on and so forth, there was enormous, enormous opportunity. We also had some hints from the philanthropic community that if we did do something together, there would be some money at the end of the table, which is always a good inducement. Anyway, here's the journey <clears throat> from a slide that Lucky gave me. Uh, in small print, it says achieved number one status there in 2020, fell back a little bit, back again. So this is going to go back and forth, but uh, it's, it's just amazing the ride that uh, pediatrics has had and will continue to have. This is a plan that has been hatched together by uh, uh, Carlos Del Rio and uh, Rachel sedlak uh, uh as well. I've been involved in it. And we're asking the question, Grady's mission statement states that it desires to be the premier academic safety net hospital. Premier. It's not yet there, let's just be honest. And so I've talked to John Harper about this. And I've talked with Carlos and so on. And there is money set aside from earnings that our faculty have had at, have, have, have delivered at Grady. There's 20 plus million dollars waiting. And this is a plan that remains to be executed. The goal is not to make Grady a basic science laboratory. The goal is to ask what unique population subsets are seen at Grady, what diseases do they have, and how can we tackle them, including issues of access and other, uh, other matters that are incredibly important. So I think a key part of this will be number three here establish the Center for Health Equity and Justice Research. And that will be coupled to a similar kind of uh, initiative that's going on at Emory on this, uh, at the university level as well. So lots of exciting things, I think, uh, to come over here. Carlos presented this to the board uh, back in June and July. There uh, appears to be enthusiasm to move this forward. But there will need to be some infrastructural changes at Grady in order to uh, really get this kind of thing going. Uh, also under infrastructure, I mean, excuse me, that was partnerships. I will say a word or two about Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech and our relationship is not at the level I'd like to see it. And it's not for anybody not trying. There's just changes in leadership. There's this, there's that, there's procrastination. We have an enormous opportunity, we meaning Emory, to work together with Georgia Tech. Not only do we know how successful that can be, as witnessed by the single joint department that we have, namely biomedical engineering, but there are so many opportunities in chemical engineering, in computing, electrical engineering, material science, industrial engineering, you name it. And having been in the MIT Harvard environment for some time and sort of a semi-techie at heart, I can tell you we are barely scratching the surface on this. 
we just decided a little while ago to unilaterally put out, unilaterally put out a grant, uh, an IQ grant version for technology and medicine. We were hoping that Georgia Tech would actually counter with equal amounts of money, but they didn't so far. They said they would, but they haven't. And so I said, you know what? Let's just move forward. And I asked the person who brought us those funds, and they said, please move, please move forward. We will get more money if we do this. At least now we're running the show. So the point is, there's just a lot of work to be done here. And I hope that the two administrations at a very high level will get together and make a commitment to move such a relationship forward. Part four, infrastructure. So core facilities. Core facilities, when I came, I sort of made a quick assessment of things. I was involved with this in my previous job. I know, Ravi, you've been involved with this deeply at the Mass General Brigham. And some of our facilities were pretty good. And some were not so good. And some were only OK. For example, single cell sequencing was just getting off the ground here at Emory, whereas other places were moving much more aggressively in that technology. Now, there was some skepticism, and still is some. But it's been more than, more than validated the last few years. So we brought in a number of folks. We brought in some investigators. And we also brought in some equipment. And, and, I, and I have to give credit to David Stevens, who in his one and a half years as interim dean really started moving things forward in this direction. So this has continued. And now we have Adam Marcus, who is specifically tasked in the dean's office to be reviewing this on an ongoing basis. And so here are just a few stats to take a look at. We have a lot of facilities. Some of them are truly, truly exceptional. The one that stands out is one that is not quite in this one, sorry, uh, is an HSRB2, and that, which I will come back to. And that is under imaging broadly. And I say this, the importance of these core facilities is not just, uh, well, it's primarily because biology has become team science. It requires big equipment the way physics got transformed. It's no longer one postdoc sitting in one room, sort of sheltered from everybody else and doing their thing. It is becoming big time team science. And the ability to analyze big data, for example, is not something that any one individual will own. It's something that has to be established at a very core level, along with its supporting infrastructure, meaning, for example, what do we need for high performance computing to do to analyze the kind of data that comes out, not just preclinically, but clinically as well. So here's another little infrastructure piece with an incredible return on investment, about 14 to 1. And that is that those who miss NIH funding, for various reasons. And this has been started at many places. We're not unique to this. How do we give them a bridge funding so that they can reapply and answer the criticisms in the, in the grant? And so this program has been run by Jerry Boss. We'll help from a number of folks, Lisa Carlson and others on the administrative side. And here you have it. Uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's a formal process. We spend about $400,000 a year on this thing. And we've gotten back. Uh, about 14 to 1 in our investment. Now, there's no control experiment, meaning if we didn't do this, would these folks have gotten that as well? Uh, there are ways of doing that, by the way. You can take the one that we didn't fund, one that's below, and then see how those fare, for example, and you can play games of that. Anyway, we haven't played any games. We just take the ones we, can, we like, and if we have the money to do it, we do it. And we spend about 400000 a year. This is the facility that will be inaugurated on March 15th. We're all extremely proud of this. Uh, the groundbreaking ceremony was just a little while ago. Uh, and uh, one of the most exciting things in this place, first, first of all, it, it, it is meant to encourage collaboration. You'll get your daily exercise if you're in this building, because you'll be able to walk up and down and sideways in order to transact business. We have core facilities located at various levels, so you have to mix with other people. We have wet lab folks right next to dry lab folks, so you have to mix with those. There'll be a nice cafeteria in, in, in the lower level. And very importantly, and, and I forgot to mention the imaging, which is second to none. The cyclotron is right down here. If you haven't seen it, uh, please take a, <laughs> go and take a look. It's, it, it, you know, it's quite something, the MR equipment and so on and so forth. And then on the ground floor, thanks to Raymond Chinazi and uh, his uh, family, uh, through a $10 million donation, is being referred to as the innovation floor. There are all kinds of interesting things being done on that floor. First of all, we have worked through all the regulatory and other issues, and you can start a company on this floor. If you have the right IP, and you'll need a little bit of money, but we're going to subsidize that quite heavily. So this will be uh, like Lab Central, if you're familiar with that in, in the Cambridge-Boston area. 
You'll get a bench, you'll get two benches. If you want four, you get four benches. The most important thing is you'll get access to all the core facilities and so on. So we've worked all of that out, and, and Mike Cassidy and, and Rachel and uh, folks in Biolocity, uh, Courtney uh, Law and, and, and others are working on this. It'll be a place for companies to demonstrate the latest and greatest gadgets. We had this going at Harvard. It was very interesting. They bring in their gadgets. Our principal investigators get to use them, generate very novel data. These are new gadgets, not even on sale yet. NIH loves it. Sometimes they'll give you money to buy the gadget. But at the very least, you might get your grant. Why do the companies like it? Because they beta test. They utilize our PIs as they would utilize it, will hopefully utilize our PIs to give them feedback. So that planning is going on. And there's some interesting back and in, you know, ways of doing those agreements. In other words, the question is who pays who? Is the company paying us to do this or are we paying the company to do this? And we can have a discussion about that. So that's the innovation for. There's also um, AR, VR stuff that's being planned there. There's a micro machining facilities for microelectronics and so on. We don't want to duplicate. We're not going to have a nano fabrication facility. That's at Georgia Tech. That's more than what we can afford, and there's no point duplicating that. But microfluidics, for example, is not something that needs some very complex equipment to, to uh, enact. So I think this will be really an exciting interface between technology and medicine on this floor, and between industry and us on this floor. Bucket number five. We have singled out the words innovation and entrepreneurship. It's not that we expect everybody to be an entrepreneur. But the spirit of what this is about, which means risk taking, which means failing often but failing early, trying new things, is what this, is, this fifth theme is all about. So in this theme, for example, you'll see here on the bottom left, design thinking and medical education. Design thinking is a way of innovating, of, of being creative and innovating. It is not the only way. How do we teach this at all levels, to faculty, to learners, et cetera? We, so, so there's teaching aspects to this. And then there are actual centers that are being formed. And I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of them. Uh, but there are all kinds of interesting activities going on for students, for trainees, and for faculty. So here are two of them. The Georgia CTSA was renewed. Uh, this is a $60 million. Thank you. Uh, lots of, uh, so is Bob Taylor here? I don't see Bob. Maybe he's online somewhere. Uh, but, uh, but thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yes, that's what I thought. That's <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Niall is here. And uh, there's lots of folks who are involved with this. And we were successful in renewing this. It was a long and complex process. and. Uh, uh, but everything worked out uh, uh, just fine. This is a center that I direct. Uh, I'm very grateful for the provost's office and the EVPHA at that time, John Lewin, to put in initial support in this. And then we were able to get my good friend, Cheryl Chan, to contribute $10 million to set this center up. So this center is focused on ideas that are not, are not moving forward because there's no money to be made. So if a 10 cent drug can be added to a $100,000 drug to improve its efficacy, somebody ought to test that and put it to a trial. So how do you generate these ideas? How do you generate the database? How do you actually design the trials? How do you get them funded? How do you get investigators initiated, excuse me, interested, who also have competing for-profit grants that pay a lot more per person than what we can? These are all the challenges. So what we've decided to do is take this to, at a national level. We feel the sort of mini epiphany in this was we need to do a few studies here at Winship. We've been focused on cancer, but we have ideas in long COVID, for example. We'll do some initial studies here for safety and feasibility. But if we can, we'd like to take this whole enterprise to the community. That concept is something that the FDA is very interested in, many others are interested in. And COVID has actually allowed us to think about so-called decentralized trial, trials, so-called platform design trials, and so on. So a lot more than we can discuss about this. So here are two other uh, initiatives. One is where we have uh, School of Medicine fourth year uh, students uh, participating in uh, a class at Georgia Tech. Again, the obvious thing here is the fourth year students by now have some sense of where the clinical issues are. And the tech students are looking for what to do with their technology. So this is, again, the obvious reason for why we need 
a, a closer relationship between tech and us. And this is at the student level now. And this is something that Rachel and, and several others, Steve Gowdy, Adam Klein, and Ali Kraut, and Rachel Krupp, um, have just started. Uh, this is a relationship with Georgia Tech, among others. And it's really to tell the stories of successful and not so successful entrepreneurs. Where, where are the stumbling blocks? What, you know, what mentorship was needed, and so on. And there was a program like this uh, called Biolocity. Uh, but this is a sort of an illustration of what succeeds and doesn't succeed. So it was, a, it was, a, it was a great session the other day when we had uh, one of these. On the education side, lots going on here. So first of all, there is a lot going on. We don't only educate MD students. Uh, sometimes we forget that. I forget that sometimes. There are a lot of academic programs going on here. And here's a, a rough uh, uh, enumeration of, of these different programs and the students who are in these programs. I think we need to, we are in the process of revising the medical, not just the curriculum, but we call that framework the Education Transformation Plan. And uh, all of this is being looked at. We're not just focusing it on MD education. So uh, just a few uh, pictures to capture uh, some of the excitement here. The Physician's Assistant Program is, is a well-celebrated program, ranks very well at a national level by a number of criteria. Lots going on there. Genetic Counseling Program is quite a unique one. Uh, celebrating its 10th year, as you can see there. Uh, there. There's quite a demand for these folks, by the way, and we, could, we, we need to systematically think about which ones do we want to enlarge, which ones do we not want to enlarge, or maybe even uh, not proceed with. And, and there's a discussion of that starting now. There are new leaders in education. Here are a number of them that uh, uh, mainly uh, recruited mainly from the uh, advancements from the inside, some from the outside. George Falk is here from the University of Syracuse. Uh, who's director of the Division of Physical Therapy. We are in the final stages of the first uh, search there. And this is, uh, came out of a, some advice we got from a consulting group to name a senior associate dean, reporting to Bill Lely in this case, uh, for uh, education transformation, really to look at innovative ways of pedagogy as well as curricular content. And so that's in its final stages, and hopefully we will get the candidate that we want. Uh, remains to be seen, but I have, I have high hopes. So we have lots of awards that go on on the, on the, uh, uh, both on the education side. Here's the, the Dean's Teaching Award. A number of folks were nominated, and uh, we have a three-hour ceremony in October that's always a lot of fun, uh, and just to see everybody coming on stage and so on. Uh, and it's, it's just been wonderful. So, this is maybe a little too wordy, but this is where we're going here. I think if there's one thing uh, I would pick out, it is what's in bold here about challenging the status quo. We want the folks who graduate from here, whether they go into practice, whether they go into educating other folks, whether they go into dis discovery, whether they go into health policy, whether they go into biotech, to be willing to challenge the status quo. That's really fundamentally that aim five, of course, in the, in the strategic framework. Don't be afraid to do this. And we know medicine is changing very quickly. And so we need folks who not just can respond, but actually are the leaders in making those changes. So I would say of all the things in here, not necessarily only single one out, but the ability to challenge the status quo for the better, we hope, of course, is what this is all about. So here there's a six pillar plan, which you can read at, at, at your leisure. Uh, there are obvious synergies between this and what's going on on the research side, as, as should be apparent by um, some of the wording here. I'll just spend a minute or two. Student support and well-being. Students are extremely stressed these days. I mean, everybody is stressed. Faculty is stressed. Learners are all kinds. No question about it. But we have actually enlarged this office because we are noticing more and more students in uh, situations where we'd rather not see them. And the quicker we act on that, the better. I remind people that at the Mass General where I train, and yeah, I don't know if you had this or continue when you were chief resident there, we were asked to see a psychiatrist every month as, an in, as interns and residents. And first I said, well, you know, I'm fine. I mean, why do I need to see him? Uh, it was one of the most memorable experiences in my three years at the Mass General. The person was just right. I mean, the person has to be chosen just right, because there's always some reluctance of an intern or resident saying, I'm the physician. I know everything. 
I'm well adjusted. And yet there were things that came out during those one-to-one -one encounters that were absolutely wonderful. And so attention to well-being, even before, and here we have Chad in the background and, and uh, Tim uh, uh, Cunningham as well, who've been involved in the wellness initiative, at all levels is going to become increasingly important. Forward-thinking educational programs, you'll see some topics mentioned there, leadership, change management, health disparities, data science literacy. What constitutes a core of data science literacy is something that Tim Buckman, for example, is very interested in, many others are, Gary Clifford, Anand Padabushi, et cetera. We need to define that. If you're in private practice and your boss comes and nods on your shoulder and says, hey, by the way, for appropriately adjusted parameters, your expenditures are twice as much as the fellow next door, you better know how to operate an Excel spreadsheet and, and, and look at large data and, and you know, be able to analyze it to figure out why. So everybody's going to have to have a, some level of literacy in this. And we need to define that. We need to incorporate it. This is not just an add-on into the curriculum. It's going to be an integral part of how people practice medicine, let alone other things that can be done with data, of course. Innovation space, uh, you, you've heard what we talked about there. There is a space right now, so-called hatchery, which is meant mainly for students. Uh, and we contribute funds to that. School of Medicine contributes about one-sixth of that, uh, that investment that was initiated from the provost's office with three schools, business school, the School of Medicine, uh, and the college contributing uh, the half. The provost was half, we were a half. We were one-sixth. So this is the initiative, Education Transformation, uh, led by two uh, uh, folks, Jada Bussey-Jones and Eric Sundberg. Eric, thank you. And Jada, I didn't see you here. But these are two individuals with very different backgrounds. And so it's exciting to see how they're coming together and moving their steering committee together. And that committee, which they head, is, has data funneling in from the six pillars that I just mentioned. These map basically identically to the six pillars I just mentioned to you. And those committees are all meeting. Um, and uh, Linda, I don't know how it's going. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you're, you're, you're a member of that committee. I, I know at times the Kool-Aid hasn't been drunk completely. I have my spies on these committees, uh, not necessarily yours. Uh, but so there's just a lot to be done here. And uh, uh, th this is going to be revolutionary once, once it uh, matures a little bit more. So I'm, I'm very upbeat about this, and, and we'll look forward to continuing uh, participating in this. Here are some interesting little pilots that are going on. On the right, again, in terms of wellness, uh, Kristen Hairston is here, uh, has been hired as a new individual, specifically focused on well-being. And uh, there are some interesting pilots that are being conducted. Bill has been very excited about this, and we're getting some interesting feedback from this pilot on the left side. This program, EPIC, is a program where uh, undergraduates and graduate students serve as mentors to folks in the underrepresented uh, uh, com uh, community uh, and try to get them excited about careers in, in medicine, STEM, et, et cetera, higher education. The program on the bottom right uh, is a program where we have peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Folks admitted here who are from underrepresented minorities coaching and helping folks who are just starting med school for example. In addition, so that's a sort of a peer-to-peer -peer kind of relationship. And then on the right, uh, Tracy Henry is looking very carefully at our, at our curriculum in terms of the issues that are mentioned here. Really systematically looking through every lecture that is given, literally. Uh, and this is an issue that started, I, I happen to be on the Harvard University board uh, that was elected recently. My second meeting, somebody stood up and said, hey, we're unique in the country. We're actually doing this in our med school. And I said, well. <laughs> so uh, somebody's thinking along the same lines, which is good. So it's, it's I think, really important to really look at this uh, you know, from, from the get-go with, with, with a new eye. The LCME is always a tricky business. Uh, they have their way. Uh, maybe that's a nice way to put it or whatever. But uh, when I first came here, I know John Lewin told me, when you accept the job, you're going to show up on November 1. I said, well, why is that? He said, well. There's a reason you'll find out. Well, the reason is that we weren't doing so well on our on our LCME, and we were. Was it formally a warning? Uh, it was a warning, right? Yeah, yeah. So I walked into the warning, so to speak. 
anyway, I memorized 800 pages pretty quickly. And uh, I still remember the event. I literally, I was told by members of the committee not to be disappointed if nobody shook my hand when, I walked, when they walked into the room. And I, I, I don't know who told me that, whether it was you, Erica, or Bill, or one of you folks. And I said, well, what is this? And they said, well, this is the way this committee convened. So I decided I was going to walk into the room and shake hands. If they didn't want to put their hands out, that's OK. So the meeting was David Stevens and I were to have this meeting at the Emory Conference Room. And somehow David got lost. He, was, <laughs> he didn't show up for, for the first 15. <laughs> David, I know you're listening on the other side, because you, David told me he wasn't going to be here. Uh, so David, I think you came in about five or 10 minutes late. And so I knocked on the door. I didn't want to be late of the hotel room. And this person came out, and I put my hand out, and he smiled. Of course, I checked the bios of these three very carefully, and I knew there was one person who was unlikely to shake my hand. But the first two did, and the third one did not. So the experiment was, but anyway, we, uh, they asked me a million questions before David got there, and I think the answers were reasonable, so we did do all right. In any event, we have a very organized plan now that Eric and Holly are uh, heavily involved with, as well as many others. Uh, and uh, this, I think, will be a much smoother process uh, since uh, the last one. So that's in the spring of 2024. <clears throat> this has probably been the best match of the, of the century, right? Yes. <laughs> so Bill ascertains that for me. I, I've looked at the places our folks have gone to. They're shown here uh, in, in sort of graphical form. And some of the quotes, I think, are, are very nice as well. It's always an exciting day coming up fairly shortly, as you all know. And I want to give a special shout out to the residents. In some ways, these folks fall in the middle. They're not the students who we really sort of cater to almost, uh, you know, really worry about a lot and so on. And they're not the faculty. Sort of in this middle group. And the reason I want to give a particular shout out to this group is because of their performance during COVID more than anything else. These folks moved from hospital to hospital where even the requirement for protective gear for this, for that, differed. They had to learn all these new things. Not only they had to learn different uh, electronic healthcare you know, uh, systems and so on, but the, all of this was compounded on. And they did an absolutely marvelous job. So I really want to applaud them. We have started. <laughs> Thank you. We started a small benefits plan for the residents, which was unheard of. You know, they need to start planning for retirement as well, never too early. <laughs> so it's a small plan, but it has kicked in, and I think they're very appreciative of that. This is a complex topic. As you know, residents are unionizing at various institutions. We have to do whatever we think is the right thing to do for these folks. So uh, on the clinical side, I'm just going to mention, obviously, our faculty are involved in four different healthcare systems, uh, needless to say. <laughs> and. This has been a, a, a major task of the, last, uh, of the last year and a half, and that is getting Epic off the ground. It's still having its sort of birth bank, but it is moving along. It is now in the system. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of faculty who participated in this. On the research side, there is this Encore uh, clinical trials management system as part of Epic. Uh, and a lot of nice things, I think, are going to happen once that gets up to full steam. I'll also mention that we have surveys of, uh, of our clinical faculty in terms of feedback that we get. And a number of them do extremely well. And those are mentioned on this slide. Again, we have a ceremony honoring these as part of that three hour, uh, three hour uh, annual celebration. At the end of the day, it is all about people. It is about people. It is about the culture that the people generate and subscribe to. This is an office that we began just officially. Uh, Carol, this is a year and a half now? March 1st, so it's, it's just one year. And uh, very proud of this. There is a plan behind this that Cheryl and her colleagues are, are instrumental in putting together with a lot of support from the chairs and uh, really crisscrosses all kinds of areas, as you might imagine. Interfaces very nicely with what's going on at Winship, for example, what's going on at Emory Healthcare, and so on. And these are sort of the four pillars in that plan with more operational aspects uh, delineated here in these six, uh, six different bullets. So there's a lot that can be done here. Literally, the sky's the limit. But we have made a start. We just had an external review in 
We were nervously waiting for the report to come back. So Cheryl was nervously waiting. I was nervously waiting. For it. But anyway, uh, uh, we got a very nice report just back, uh, just a few minutes ago, today, in fact, uh, from our second external review of what we're trying to do. This has a ways to go. Make no mistake, we have still a ways to go in this space. And uh, uh, so we'll look forward to celebrating uh, some of our successes in the days to come. Here, talking about people, are awards from external, uh, uh, external recognition awards that we've won. Um, and uh, we haven't mentioned the names, we've just cited you know, the, the numbers here. The numbers are trickling up, uh, as you might expect, as we hire more and more uh, faculty and as they're achieving greater uh, distinction. Faculty leaders, uh, here are six that we would like to recognize. Uh, all are from within, except for two. Reshma Jakshi, who is from the University of Michigan, as the chair of Brad Ankh, and Alyssa Panik, as from the University of California, Davis, uh, in, uh, to chair the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So, what other fun facts should I tell you about myself? So a few thoughts about transitions. Transitions are always difficult, and there are a lot of them going on. And it's understandable that people are a little bit finicky, fidgety, rather, excuse me, about <laughs> being finicky. Uh, that's understandable. But I think we have some wonderful, wonderful people here. Those who've been here for a while, who know the system, and will provide a great deal of continuity, even during this transition time. So there's Carlos Del Rio, who's of course right here. Carlos will start his duties as interim dean on March 1st. So Carlos and I have been talking quite a bit uh, and have been hearing from our administrative team as well, many hours, and uh, I am sure the transition will be very smooth. We are both committed to that. I'm not going anywhere. I don't know if that's good news or bad news, but uh, I will be around and happy to help Carlos at any time. So last couple of slides, lessons learned and looking ahead. Yes, we do have challenges. And I've been pretty blunt about these challenges. We know some of the issues with Emory Healthcare finances, and they, that, of course, makes a huge difference to the School of Medicine because of the investment that Emory Healthcare traditionally has made and continues to make in the School of Medicine. That investment is being cut back this year, and that has significant impact on us. The Excellence and Eminence Plan also needs significant and continued support. We were told three, four years ago to take off. You saw the airplane, so we did take off. We built some reserves, so we have some stuff for a rainy day. But at the end of the day, from day one, we have indicated that we do need additional support to the tune of 30 to $40 million per year in order to fully execute on this plan, which still has another two to three years, four years to go. There is research space shortage. Despite the wonderful news about HSRB2, when you add up the net space that we've gained, it's not as much as you might think. And furthermore, unless we renovate the space that has been vacated, we're not adding a whole lot more. We will be adding a whole lot more if we renovate that space. That programming is well underway. Farah Chapes and her team have been doing this with Robin Mori and others. But that has also fallen a bit behind, partly because of COVID. The feasibility plan is, is more or less there as to what gets renovated at what point and how it stays. But a lot more can be done on this. There's the Eggleston building, which could be an interesting site for, as a major focus for translational research, in addition to being a site for outpatient care. A generally risk-averse culture. I was debating whether to put this in. And I said, I, yeah, I'll put it in. I think that is generally true. And I think it's changing, which is what's really exciting. And the reason it's changing is actually uh, on, on the second bullet there is because by taking certain risks, if you want to call them risks, by making some big bets, we have won. And for the first time, really, in my view, looking at the history of the school, we have won, we've won big, and we've got a taste of what it means to play in this big league. I'm talking about some of the large grants, for example, that we've won, some of the impact that we've had in COVID. Two region centric of you. We, I strongly believe, well, whatever we do, we need to help our neighbors here. We need to help the city, no question. But the, so act locally, but the view should be a global one. 
And we have a lot going on in, the, in that space. That's not what I'm talking about, global health. What I'm talking about is that the successes, that the successes that we need to trumpet here are the successes that will have national and international impact. And that's just not quite in the DNA to the, of the fabric of this institution to the extent that I would like to see. Slow decision making at times, but it is improving, I'm happy to say. But I think that's also a little bit in our culture that it's not something that actually helps us out in the long run. So I've said what, what are sort of nice things that have been going on. And indeed, uh, we are at an inflection point, as these two, whatever those animals are, are, are saying to each other. We really are at an inflection point. It shows, it shows based on whether it's grant support or whether it's based on activities in education, et cetera, et cetera. And there is so much, so much going for us, incredible philanthropic support. Atlanta still is a very attractive city to move to a diverse, collaborative, and highly talented faculty. One of the things I've looked for, and I hope this will continue, having come from Boston where the egos reach no limit, as you, I'm sure you all know, and I'm sure Ravi will corroborate, I felt it very important as we've recruited some of the senior faculty to pick people who are truly, truly excited about not only their own research, but about mentoring and collaborating with other folks. And I think of the six, seven game changers, so-called quote unquote game changers that we've recruited, whose names I didn't fill up here. Every one of those people has been selected with that in mind. And I've been open with them and told them right up front, if you're not gonna contribute to the greater welfare, not just to what you do in your own lab, sorry, this is not the place for you. So it's that fine line that has to be struck. I think a very important one. And access to a diverse patient population, enormous opportunities there, needless to say especially in the clinical trial arena, for example. We were talking the other day about the fact that at Mass General Brigham, over a four-year period, the clinical trial portfolio went from 77 million, roughly speaking, to about 180 million, if I remember the numbers correctly, approximately. We have a diverse population. Even within Emory Healthcare, we have a diverse population. But if we included Grady, if we included the folks at Children's and others, and the VA, that's huge. Now, those are more complex arrangements to have. I understand that. But this is not something we've capitalized on to the extent that we probably can and should. And for the first time, I believe, and of course, I've only been here five years, there is unprecedented university support at the highest level for what is going on in the health sciences. And that was not always the case. We have some amazing core facilities and, and other interesting partnership opportunities that I've already alluded to. So folks, I'm gonna paraphrase Martin Luther King and simply say that I have a dream, that one day Emory will rise up and live out the true meaning of its dream, to create, preserve, teach, and apply knowledge in the service of humanity. And by doing so, take its righteous place amongst the most elite global institutions of higher education where SOM faculty, staff, trainees, students, and alumni take great pride, take great pride in providing exceptional care to all, balancing the science and art of medicine, and pushing the frontiers of knowledge with bold ideas, in selflessly disseminating their findings for the welfare of generations to come, and in shaping health policy for the benefit of mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my dream. And so in the words of one of India's most gifted spiritual teachers of the last century, Swami Vivekananda, by the way, the trivial fact of the day, he gave a one hour talk at Harvard and was given an endowed chair. Go read that talk. I exhort you, in his words, onwards with vigor and rest not till the work is done. With deep appreciation for a wonderful five years, thank you and namaste. Thank you all.
We're done. <laughs>